good morning. Welcome. Uh, it's good to see you all here. Um, if you please stand, we're going to open with Lord Rain and Me. the earth, you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power, over all my dreams, in my darkest hour. You are the Lord of all I am, so won't you reign in me again? Over every thought, over every word, in my life reflect the beauty of my Lord more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord. be seated. We have some videos and announcements and then we'll get back to singing. Yeah, we have a few announcements. Just a reminder that um, both Olympians and the older youth group will be taking place on Sundays from 4 to 5 here at LBC. Also, a young adult group has started up. They meet on Sundays at 7 p.m. at the Fosters and you will have to talk to the Fosters about what qualifies as a young adult. <laughs> Uh, some people have been bringing in items for the love share. Thank you very much. The needs are many, and your contributions are greatly appreciated. Um, and also, the Extraordinary Life Seminar is coming up next week, finally. The, the seminar will be held Friday evening, October 23, and all day Saturday, October 24, Today is the last day to register, so if you would like to attend, please see me or Fred. And finally, it's always an exciting time when Operation Christmas Child is underway. What a privilege for us to bless those around the world who have literally nothing compared to us. For the month of October, we are collecting toiletry items for our packing party. There are also boxes on the back table if you want to fill one. And now, Michael, if you'd play the um, OCC promo. Thank you. Hey, my name is Liz, and I got a shoebox when I was just 10 years old in a Ukrainian orphanage. And now I'm trying to get as many people involved in Operation Christmas Child as I can. I am from Ukraine, and here at Virginia Tech, I am studying human development. My hope is that God can use me to reach other students to get them involved in the project and get them involved in packing boxes and that way we can reach as many children as we can. As a freshman I was terrified to talk about Operation Christmas Child because I was in a new environment but I realized that this wasn't really about me but about millions of children who are going to receive the hope that I was once given in that shoebox. I decided to speak in front of my classmates, in front of teams, in front of Greek life, and it took off from there. 
I've started an Operation Christmas Child Club that has 300 members now. I've set up pick up and drop off location for the boxes and now we've done a few packing parties on campus. The response has been great. It's so good to see college students get involved in this ministry. Receiving that shoe box was the first time that I had ever felt any kind of hope. It was the first time that I ever felt loved and that was the moment that I accepted Jesus as my family. Me packing shoebox on campus with other students just brings me joy knowing that these shoeboxes change children's lives. And from personal experience, I can tell you, it changed mine. If you would like to get your college campus involved in packing Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes, I would say just start out by praying um, and see where God takes you. Uh, Lord, we thank you for today and... Uh we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, for your love and your mercy. Um, and we just want to acknowledge, Lord, as we just sang, Lord, that, that you do reign, Lord. And, uh, it's just so easy for us, uh, uh, especially during this time when we're thinking about elections and things like that, Lord, just to forget, Lord, that you reign, that no matter who's in office, Lord, that you are King of Kings, and, and we want you to be Lord of our hearts, Lord. And so... Um, just ask your blessing on this service and uh, just ask that you draw us to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. The king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh. Inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh. a place where mercy reigns and never dies. 
There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you.
amazing love how can it be how can it be that you my king would die for me Amazing love, I know it's true. It's true. It's my joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be? My King would die for me. Amazing love. song <laughs> amazing love isn't that awesome my king would die for me is Jesus your king amen, amen. he died for us because of his love for us man we gathered here today Lord because you gave your life for us to save us your love and your grace abounds. We thank you for that, Lord God. We're amazed by that. We come here in amazement of you, Lord. We pray, Lord, that others in our families and our community may discover that love. Open their hearts, Lord. Let us be a light in our community, Lord, to bring others to you, to that amazing love. Lord God, I just pray that um, our service today can be fulfilling for all of us, Lord, to speak powerfully, powerfully through Joel. Open our ears, Lord. Open our hearts to your word, to your teaching. Let us worship you today, Lord, in all we do, in our actions, in our words, in our thoughts. Like I pray, Lord, let us be a light to the community let us be a light to our families that aren't saved, that don't know you, Lord. We pray that they find the love and the joy that we have in you and the forgiveness because of your work on the cross, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, we want to allow all those involved in Children's Church the opportunity to be dismissed.
Well, I hope that uh, we all are enjoying fall. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me, uh, fall is uh, uh, a very busy time. And uh, it involves a lot of things. My dead mouse count is up to 14 so far. Um, (laughs) um, And uh, that doesn't count the ones that got caught in the sticky trap and disappeared with the trap. (laughs) But I can smell them, but I can't find them. (laughs) So Christy's lucky she's away. (laughs) You know, the ones that get poisoned in the wall, they're there for a while too. (laughs) But amidst uh, killing mice and chopping wood and all of the fall activities that are going on, uh, we, we kind of tend to be busy, and uh, for me, uh, just having so much on my plate lately on, on a lot of different fronts, um, I, I got behind on um, my Bible reading. I, I read through the Bible every year, um, and uh, just on a regular basis, and I, I've kind of gotten behind on that, and... Uh, and, I, and, and the readings are in the Old Testament and the New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs. Um, and so I, I kind of got behind in Isaiah. Um, I'm way behind in Isaiah. I think it's into Jeremiah, and I'm still in Isaiah. And I got behind in the New Testament. But the things that I wouldn't let go of is uh, the Proverbs, which is only a couple of verses of wisdom, which I find so pertinent um, seems like to, to that very day, and, um, and the Psalms. Um, kind of reminds me of a, a story I like to tell from the Psalms, uh, the book of Psalms. Uh, we had a, 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 a guy here several years ago, J.R., and, and uh, he, he didn't read real well, so he always listened to an audio Bible. And, um, and one day he found his dog chewing up his audio Bible. And, um, and he grabbed the, the, the audio versions f- uh, from the dog, and uh, the dog was chewing up the psalms. Um, and, uh, and I can remember his response to, to that was, no, no, not the psalms, you know. <laughs> it was like, you can't, I can't give up the psalms. He loved the psalms. And uh, if, if other books had to be chewed up, he just didn't want the psalms to be chewed up. Uh, reminds me of Jeremiah fifteen sixteen. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. I guess the dog took that literally. Uh, and uh, they were the rejo- joy and rejoicing of that dog's heart, but uh, not of JR's. <laughs> so I, um, I, I wanted to, to, you know, we finally finished the book of Mark. Um, I, I looked this week how long it took us to get through the book of Mark. Um, it was two years and one week. <laughs> But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim a little bit of grace since I, I, don't, I, I don't preach one Sunday a month and I often take long breaks for, for special days and holidays. That's my excuse. Um, but we did get through the book of Mark. And uh, so I have been really praying and contemplating uh, where to go next in terms of uh, the preaching of God's word. Um, a number of you, um, and I believe that the Holy Spirit is indwells every believer. Uh, we talked about that in Life Group this week, that we're believer priests. And, and so I do try and listen to uh, what I hear from the body and what the Spirit is, is speaking through our body. And, and a number of you have been, frankly, on my case to um, preach the book of Revelation for some time. <laughs> I've gotten some pretty direct... Um, <laughs> exhortations in that level. <laughs> and I have really, uh, there, there's a number of reasons that what I won't go into while, while I, have, uh, I have kind of avoided that book in the past. I have taught through it, but I've never preached through it. Um, and I was really praying and contemplating and looking at all the work that's involved in the book of Revelation. And lo and behold, all the notes that I had from when I, I taught through it have disappeared. And uh, so my head start is gone, and um, and I really prayed about that and tried to evaluate where we were as a body, uh, where I was at individually, and uh, and I want to give you hope. I, I plan to preach through the Book of Revelation, 
starting in January. <laughs> we got, <a>, yeah. <laughs> We have a lot of holidays coming. I got a lot of excuses. <laughs> yeah, yeah maybe, it'll, maybe it'll be completed before we get there. That would be great. I'm good with that, Lord. <laughs> Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. <laughs> That's from the book of Revelation, okay? <laughs> but I have decided in the meantime, uh, and part of this is coming from myself personally, um, to go back to the book of Psalms. And can I say, because I had this discussion this morning, uh, it is the book of Psalms, plural. Each one is an individual psalm. So it's Psalm 13 that we're going to look at today. Um, and uh, j- just to, to uh, clarify that. I also want to say, just by way of encouragement, you know, the videos we saw this morning had a common theme, and that was the courage of these young people, uh, both of them, to, to, to speak up about who they were as, in, as Christians, who they are in Christ, and have the boldness to be able to share that uh, publicly. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I didn't ask his permission, but I, I heard from a parent uh, this week about who was having a, a, a Zoomed uh, conference, a teacher's conference, about uh, one of the teachers said uh, was complimenting their son for um, in the midst of a class discussion speaking up and saying um, well I'm a Christian and uh, and so my perspective as a Christian is and he gave his perspective I want to tell you that really encouraged not just me but our entire board (laughs) And so kudos, Michael, on speaking up for who you are. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I should have asked your permission to share it, but I I know you're a little shy, and I hope it's okay. You'll forgive me. (laughs) Well, let's, let's, before we we jump into the book of Psalms, uh, let's ask the Lord to direct our hearts. Father, we just uh, thank you for who we are in Christ, and... uh, Help us to have the boldness of these young people to speak that out. And Lord, sometimes we get discouraged in the midst of what's going on in this world and, and even in our relationship with you. And I thank you for the Psalms that bring us comfort, challenge, encouragement, uh, and strength uh, when we encounter those times. Op- open our hearts to what you have to say to us through this Psalm of David today. And... Um, and encourage our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I always like to, when I, when I speak on the Psalms, uh, to give a little bit of, uh, and I'll try and do a little more of this. Uh, and by the way, I'm not going in any particular order. I'm just trying to be led by the Spirit. Um, so because we're doing Psalm 13 doesn't mean I'm, I won't go back. <laughs> but I probably won't preach all of 150, okay? <laughs> um, you know, the book of Psalms is, um, is uh, it's important to realize when we read it what kind of literature it is because it impacts how we interpret it. And so let me say a couple of things about that. First of all, a psalm is a poem. Uh, it's uh, their poetry and they have to be studied and understood as poetry. Um, and Hebrew poetry is different than ours. Our poetry, at least it used to be, was based on rhyme and rhythm. Um, he, Hebrew poetry is not based on that. It's based on what's called parallelism. Um, and therefore, um, it, it, um, it uh, translates well. And so in the parallelism, you usually have a first line that's followed by a second line that either expands on that first line, clarifies it, uh, con- completes it, contrasts it. There's all different kinds of parallelism. Um, but, but you have to understand Hebrew poetry works that way. You know, poetry is a, an intense form of communication. Um, it's really the language of the heart, not so much the language of, um, you know, strict reason or logic. Um, and so we need to understand that when we come to, to the Psalms and, and we read, you know, the, the mountains skip like rams. Well, it doesn't mean literally the mountains got up and skipped like rams. It's a, it's a figure of speech. And, and so we, we need to understand the poetry and, and what it's saying. 
Secondly, a psalm is also a song. Uh, the Psalms, the book of Psalms was originally Israel's songbook. Um, it was their hymnal. In fact, the Hebrew title for Psalms is Tehillim, which means songs of praise. So um, the Psalms have always been important to believers for worship. And, and you're even going to see in Psalm 13, there's a musical note in there to the choir master. Um, there's, uh, and, and, and of course, um, many of those notes uh, were lost, but, um, um, but we have some of those. Um, and so we don't have a lot of the interpretation of the Psalms uh, from different generations. We don't have the, the musical score, if I can say it that way. Um, so each generation gets to put their own music to these words. Um, and we sing these words often. You may not realize a lot of our songs come from the book of Psalms. Um, uh, a psalm is also an expression of worship. Um, you know, um, in the Old Testament, you have different forms of revelation. You have the historical books and the prophets that are, are more revelatory. You have reflection, uh, the wisdom books and prophet, uh, book of Proverbs, for instance. But the book of Psalms is more a book of response. It's, it's the response of a worshiper to God and to life and to meeting life in the midst of God, uh, meeting God in the midst of life. And, and that's what we'll see from Psalm 13. Um, the worship in Psalms is usually more public than private, although Psalm 13 is going to um, be a little bit more individual. Um, and it focuses on God and his character and his works versus our, in contrast to our experience. Um, the Psalms and, and are also prayers. And so we're going to see a lot of prayers in the midst of Psalms in, in poetic form and in song form. And finally, the Psalms are praise. Um, they elevate God in the end. Uh, almost every Psalm, with a couple of exceptions, ends from moving from struggle to encountering God to praise of God. Um, and we're going to see some of that today. So I just, to give us a little introduction to uh, the book of Psalms. Um, this particular psalm is known by Bible scholars as a lament psalm. Uh, so we might use the word complaint. <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, this, is, this psalm is one of those complaining psalms, and, uh, and it's a movement from complaint to confidence in God. So I, I've entitled the sermon today, From Desperation to Delight. Um, we don't know. We know it's a psalm of David, so David, the the, the psalm, uh, psalm psalmist of Israel. Um, but we don't know the circumstances. We can pick up that uh, it was a time of difficulty. Um, it could be that it was physical difficulty. He was approaching death. You're going to see a little of that. It might be a difficult time in his life. I tend to think of the times when he was being pursued by the relentless enemy Saul before he became king, though he had been anointed by God, or maybe the time when Absalom, his son, uh, rebels against him and you know, tries to kill him and take over the kingdom, and, uh, and he's running from him. I mean, those might fit the, the context of Psalm 13. Um, and I think it reminds us and, and makes us question, what do we do when life falls apart? When we don't feel like we can go on? When we are out of gas spiritually and God seems a million miles away? Um, David shows us in this psalm how to move from that kind of de desperation to delight. And he does it with, in three parts, uh, three steps. Um, you have to read this psalm with emotion because uh, there's a lot of emotion with it. Um, someone has likened this psalm to, um, you know, to, to watching the ocean. You know, we were in, in Maine earlier this year and, and uh, we were driving along, I think it was Long Beach in, uh, 
in York, Maine, and, and um, we'd never seen the waves like this before. They were washing up over the seawall and, and splashing onto the cars that were coming down, that we were driving down. And, and we'd been down that road many, many times, and, and there, there was just an angry sea, you know? And, and those waves were crashing onto the cars and the people, and, and, uh, and it was something to behold the power and the anger of, of that ocean wave. Um, and... Uh, and I can also remember a time in Maine when, uh, after years of watching everyone else do it, we decided to take, pay for one of those sailing cruises. And uh, we were coming out of Ogonquit, uh, Perkins Bay in Ogonquit, Maine, and, and we got on one of those cruises, you know, those nice sailing ships, and, and, and we go out of, of the harbor, and, uh, and there was no wind at all. <laughs> You know, we were going to hike out and be on the side of that thing, and <laughs> nothing. I mean, it was like glass. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, we had a good captain who was a, a Gloucester fisherman who told lots of jokes, so he kept us entertained. And eventually, a little breeze picked up, and we ended up going somewhere. <laughs> but the contrast between those two things, I think, is a great picture of Psalm 13. It starts out like that angry sea, full of emotion, and... And, and, and desperation. And then as we move through the psalm, it begins to calm down until we get to the end, and it's like still as glass. So we can hopefully feel that emotion as we go through. I'm going to read it to begin with. You don't have to put this up, Michael. You don't have it. Because um, I'm going to read it out of a different version. I'm going to read the New Living Translation. And I'm just going to read it through to, to begin with. Oh, Lord... How long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat saying, We have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. <laughs> I hope we can sense the movement in that psalm as we go through. The, the psalm begins, and, and we can put these up, Michael, uh, in verses 1 and 2 with... Uh, the psalmist David's predicament or his complaint. Um, he is expressing some of his fear. And he begins with this phrase, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? And it has the idea, will you forget me forever or completely or continually? Um, and you're going to see in, the, in this first verse, first couple of verses, a phrase repeated four times. And the phrase is, how long, how long, how long, how long? It's, it's a major complaint. His major complaint is, it appears, with the trouble of God's timing. <laughs> how long? David is weary of hanging on, waiting for God to show up, waiting for him to intervene, waiting for him to act. His perseverance and his patience are running out. How long will God leave him in the midst of this difficult situation? You know, I've listed his complaints this way. Complaint number one, it's, uh, their complaints are all about time. God, it's time to show up. <laughs> um, you know, it appears to him when he says, well, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? God appears, he seems, he feels absent and uncaring. It feels like he's forgotten him or maybe even avoiding him or ignoring him. You know, any, anybody who has had a close friend or a, or a parent of a child who's away from home and, and you never hear from them... <laughs> And you, you know, and, and, and mom says, you never call, you never write, you never even text. <laughs> Are you still alive? <laughs> you know, how long? <laughs> you know, where are you? <laughs> are you still there? When are you going to show up? Um, you know, and, that, and that's David's complaint in this, you know. Where are you, God? Have you forgotten all about me? You know? Um, 
Are you ever going to take notice of me? Are you, are you ever going to, you know, show up? <laughs> and then his second complaint is, how long will you hide your face from me? It's not only, he's not only saying, God, it's time to show up. He's saying, it's, it's time to stop hiding. <laughs> you know, have you ever felt like God was hidden from you? Well, I have. <laughs> you know, it, it seems like he's a million miles away. You know, your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and not really doing any good. Um, you know, a spouse who leaves angry or a jilted lover, uh, there's a feeling of separation and, and distance, even in their voice. You can tell it in their voice. Uh, their, their face is hidden from me. Um, you know, and, and in the Psalms, um, you know, and actually in all, all of the Old Testament, when, when it talks about God's face being hidden from us, it's like his presence, his his experienced presence isn't there, you know. He seems hidden. Um, have you ever felt God hidden from you? Yep. Have you ever felt forgotten by him? Why, why does God do that? Why does he withdraw his felt presence from us at times? Boy, if you read Oswald Chambers as I do, it was perfect along these lines this morning. You know, why he answers this question, why does God do this? I mean, part of it is God's entrusting you with something that's going to take you a lot deeper, <laughs> you know. Um, and I know that's, that has been true in my life. There have been times when I, I just couldn't find God. In fact, during one of those crises of faith for me, a, a friend of mine gave me a book, um, Disappointment with God, and, and, and the answer is three questions. Where is, he, where is God when he's silent, where, when he's hidden? And I can't remember the third one, but, um, you know, I felt that before. Um, and and w- what do we do when, when, when God feels hidden from us? Well, his third complaint is also about time. It's, time. it's time for me to stop struggling. How long must I take counsel in my soul? The, the New Living says, how, how long must I struggle with anguish in my soul? You know, this is how David feels. He feels left alone. He feels abandoned by God in constant turmoil. He feels, he feels like he's been left with no resources but his own, no help from God, and he spends every night wrestling uh, with his own mind and heart, trying to think his way out of his problems. And this is self-deliverance, and it isn't working. In fact, all it does is produce more anxiety and more fear. You know? So it's, and when we see the contrast with, with what comes next, you're almost going to feel like every night all I do is struggle with anxieties and fears. You know? Endless struggle. And then he says, and have sorrow in my heart all the day. David feels, along with that anxious struggle, a deep and daily sadness of heart. A sadness that has soaked into his soul and gripped his heart. His nights are filled with anxious struggle and his days are filled with sadness um, and grief. And then he brings a fourth complaint. It's time to stop losing. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me or triumph over me? David is not only feeling anxious and grieved, he's feeling defeated. Um, What caused this? We don't really know. um, Maybe a terminal illness, maybe running from Saul time after time after time, maybe the betrayal of his own son Absalom or several of his generals who also betrayed him. We're not sure. Um, But I think we can relate. So what do we do when God seems like we're asking, where are you? (laughs) How come you're hiding from me? Why am I constantly struggling? And with all of this grief in my heart. Um, and why do the, are the bad guys always winning? And I feel like I'm always losing. Uh-oh. I don't know if you felt like that. God was AWOL, absent and uncaring about your situation, distant, hiding. Uh, maybe you just feel like, man, I'm running on empty. And uh, I'm losing hope here. And I can't go on. 
Um, I just want to say a couple of things. Number one, you are not alone. <laughs> uh, these are normal experiences for a child of God to go through. There's no indication in this psalm anywhere that it was a result of sin in David's life. You know, David wrote some great psalms on, uh, on sin and repentance, Psalm 51, 32, but there's no indication of that here. This is more the issues of life <laughs> and the circumstances of life. You know, David went through this. Joseph went through this. You know, sold into slavery by his brothers. Uh, Job went through this. You know, God decided to test him. Didn't tell Job until later. <laughs> Jeremiah, all the prophets, Paul, even Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus felt this. Uh, it is not, um, it's not necessarily because of sin, but it is part of living in a fallen world um, among fallen people. But God uses these experiences of disappointment with him to test us and to deepen our faith in him and in the end to draw us closer to him. I want to say, secondly, these are not only normal experiences for us. It's okay to be honest with God about how we feel. David's being pretty rawly honest with God. He's putting some things out there in his desperation, in his depression, in his discouragement, in his feelings of defeat. I mean, he's laying it all out of there. Um, and he's complaining to God. It's a lament psalm. <laughs> he's complaining about uh, his sadness, his frustrations, his doubts and disappointments. Um, and... Um, you know, I just want to remind us, God knows how we feel anyway, <laughs> so we might as well be honest with him. <laughs> um, and it's okay to be honest with him. And I don't mean being disrespectful or cursing God or anything stupid. I just mean being honest with him. Um, and thirdly, I want to say that we need to be willing to cry out to God in our pain, in our disappointments, in our sadness, in our grief, and our depression. We need to seek help and find hope in him. Not in the changing of the circumstances, but in God. Rather than run from him and try and drink it away or medicate it away or chase fleshly fantasies to feel good or engage in mindless, endless distractions, we need to run to him. We need to cry out to him. We need to face him. And bring it all to him in prayer. The famous Bible teacher D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, Faith is the refusal to panic. <laughs> well, David not only um, uh, pleads his, his case, gives his, um, his complaints, but he secondly uh, gives his plea or his prayer. And in it, he describes his condition and some of his foes. He, uh, he makes basically a threefold appeal. To those four complaints, he gives a threefold appeal or prayer to God. He's, he's pleading with God now. He's, he's outlined how he feels and what the problems are. And now his plea, his prayer is, God, will you please do this? And these three things, if you notice, correspond to those complaints, uh, those four complaints. Um, they are an appeal for God's attention, God's answer, and finally God's deliverance. Um, notice how he turns from his despair. He doesn't stay there. He turns from his despair to prayer. <laughs> he turns from his predicament to a plea to God. He begins with a prayer for God's attention. Consider, consider and answer me, O Lord my God. I like how the Net Bible puts, puts this. Look at me. Answer me, O Lord my God. There, there's three things he's saying there. The first is, in a, is a plea for God's attention. He's saying literally, look. Look at me, God. Consider me, you know. Turn your attention to me. Um, God has seemed absent uncaring, hidden, and distant. And so he, he's feeling alone and abandoned and sad. And so he says to God, God, will you, please, will you please look at me? Will you please turn your attention to me? I don't know where you're at. This is how I feel. 
Turn, turn your attention to me. Look at me again. Remember me again. And I want to say about that, that he's, he's appealing to the right person. <laughs> he's going to the right place. His appeal is to God. You know, look, God. <laughs> and then secondly, it's a plea for God's answer. Answer me. <laughs> oh, Lord, my God. You know, God loves it when we look to him for answers instead of everywhere and everything and everybody else. And aren't we so quick to do that? I'm having this difficult problem. I'm depressed. I'm this. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to the psychiatrist or the doctor or the counselor or this. I'll read this book and I'll do this. And, I'll, you know, and sometimes it's like the last option is to turn to God. <laughs> Can I say, you know, we often say around here, Jesus is enough. Is he really? Is he really enough? If Jesus is really enough, then he's enough. <laughs> he's sufficient for every problem, for every situation, for every circumstance. His life is sufficient for our life in he, on this earth. Peter said that his divine life gives us everything we need for life and godliness. That pretty much covers it, doesn't it, as a Christian? Life, that's what we're in. Godliness, that's what he wants. And if we have his life in us, we have it all. But we have to go to him. Let's make him, and I'm not saying some of those other things aren't helpful at times, but let's make him the priority. Let's go to him first. Let's make him. And he loves it when we do. You know, I, I think God, God is just, sometimes I just, he's just up there watching, you know. Yeah, they're going here. Yeah, they're going there. I wonder when they'll think of me, you know? <laughs> yeah, they're doing this. Oh, they're trying that. Oh, yeah. You know? Hello? What about me? <laughs> I'm the God of the universe. I created you. <laughs> I have everything you need. All you have to do is ask. Will we ask? Will we humble ourselves to ask? But we give up on our self-sufficiency and our self-efforts and our self-help and our self-healing and, and give up and surrender to God and say, I don't have it all figured out, God. I need you. I need you alone. And then he says, light up my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. This is a plea for God's deliverance. I love the new living. Restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. <laughs> this pretty, you know, this deliverance is a deliverance from two things. First, a deliverance from death and despair, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Um, you know, deliver me from death. Um, you know, in Hebrew, the th thinking, the dimming or darkening of the eyes was a sign of sickness, either physically or spiritually or both. So, you know, when the dimming of God's eyes, the darkening of, of our eyes meant, you know, we were losing hope, we were running out of the vitality of life, whether it's physical or spiritual life, our fellowship with God is disappearing, you know, that's the darkening of the eyes or the dimming of the eyes. The contrast with that is the enlightening of the eyes, you know, uh, the light has come back. Uh, into the eyes. Um, and that signifies, uh, was a sign of health, whether it be physical health or spiritual health. Uh, we've all looked at a sick person, a very, very sick person, and man, you can see it in their eyes, you know? And then when they're healthy, it's like, wow, you can see a change in their eyes and their countenance. Um, and the same is true for us when we're, we're depressed and, and we're discouraged and, and we're doubtful, you, you know, our, our eyes are, are downcast. Um, you know, even with masks on, you can still see people's eyes. <laughs> um, but the enlightening of the eyes is, is a sign of health, but it's also a sign of God's blessing. Now, how many times in Scripture does it say, shine your light, the light of your countenance on us. Shine on us. Shine on our eyes, God. Um, you know, light up my life, God. Um, you know, it's a plea for God's reviving his life, his blessing, his encouragement, and his hope. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard someone say, wow, the light has just gone out of his or her eyes. You know, that's not a good sign, whether it's physical or spiritual or emotional. Um, deeply discouraged, depressed, just existing, going through the motions, um, 
It might be internal spiritual discouragement. It might be external pressures. It might be conflict, endless conflict, or physical problems, or even pain. Uh, All of those things. Uh, But his plea is, God, deliver me. Light up my eyes again. Restore the sparkle to my eyes. And then he adds, lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. (laughs) Again, the new living, don't let my enemies gloat, saying we have defeated him. This is not just a deliverance from death, but it's a deliverance from dishonor. Um, Why is this important? You know, that the enemies not uh, triumph over him. Well, in the Old Covenant, it was a theocratic government, which means the government of Israel was a government in which God himself was, um, was king. And, and then he chose his servant um, to be the king under him. Uh, so it was, a, it was a direct government of God, a theocracy. And so for David to be dishonored or defeated meant dishonor or defeat for the name of God. What, what David's, um, David's uh, reputation is, in fact, God's reputation. Um, and so what, what is uh, at stake in David's defeat is God's reputation. And that's what's important. You know, we don't live in a theocracy anymore, but as new covenant believers and as disciples of Jesus, we are part of God's kingdom we're part of God's kingdom people and God, part of God's kingdom program here on earth. Um, we don't live in this government led directly by God under his chosen king, but we do serve in a spiritual kingdom under King Jesus. <laughs> and our enemies are not the people of this world, but they are the world itself. The world which, and the world system which constantly seeks to press us into its mold of thinking and behaving and believing. The enemies are, secondly, our flesh which seeks to serve self and, and, uh, and seek life in self-indulgent and sinful living rather than finding it in Jesus. And finally, our, our enemies are the devil who prowls about like a roaring lion, ready to pounce on us to steal our joy and kill our faith and destroy our lives. And you know what? We may say, be saying with all of those enemies, how long, O oh Lord, must I endure this? Where are you? Look at what's happening to me. Please, please help me. Deliver me from these problems, these pressures, these people, and this pain. Don't let me be defeated by the enemies of my soul. Don't let dishonor come to your name. What do we do? How do we redirect our hearts and minds from our predicament in the midst of these pleas for help? How do we find hope for ourselves amidst the difficulties and deliverance from our enemies. But we get to that finally in the last section. David found it in his praise or confidence in the Lord. He moves from fear to his foes to his faith. Notice the first two words of verse 5, but I. (laughs) Those are important words. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. You know, that word but is always a contrast, you know. And, uh, and David is getting very personal here. With an, a determined perseverance, David turns from despair and death to deep, deep trust in God. His difficult predicament has become a prayer that results now in praise. His, his complaint has moved from a, a plea for God's consideration to a confidence in God's character. His fears and foes are met by his unswerving faith in God. <laughs> and it all begins with those two simple words, but I. Those two words tell us some things. David is taking personal responsibility for turning his eyes away from his difficulties and despair and through prayer, turning his eyes on the truth of who God is and back into communion with him. 
See, he's owning his own responsibility in this. He's not just saying, you know, this is, life is terrible. I don't know where you're at, God, and, and please deliver me, and, and I'm going to sit here and pout until you come and do that. <laughs> no, he accepts the responsibility to make a choice. A choice to do what? To trust in God. To place his confidence in God in God alone. And how does he do that? Well, he first chooses to confidently trust in God's unchanging love. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. Do you feel the waves calming? <laughs> you know, the whole tone of this psalm changes when David makes a choice, despite his discouragement, despite his difficulties, to trust in what? In God's unchanging love for him. He has gone to God in honest prayer. He's laid it out how he feels. He's pleaded in dependence on him for relief. And as he has done that, a deep challenge comes to his heart and mind. I can almost hear God saying in the background, David, Joel, will you trust me in this? Will you trust me when you don't understand what I'm doing? Will you trust me when you can't feel my presence? Will you trust in my sovereign timing? My timing, not yours. And ultimately, will you trust in my steadfast, unchanging, deep, and committed love for you? Will you trust that I love you? Will we trust him in the circumstances of our life today? When it seems too long, and we don't understand what he's doing or can't feel his presence, will we choose to believe and trust in his deep, deep, unchanging love for us? Linden Bible Church, I have a message to God from you today. God loves you. And it will never stop. It will never change. His love is loyal. It's steadfast. It's unchanging. It's eternal. It's full. You know, there's two things. We were, we were to, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Oh. David answers the bell of this challenge from God with a resounding, yes, I will trust you. <laughs> in contrast to my circumstances and feelings, I will trust in your never-ending love for me. This simple yet profound choice changes his entire outlook on life. He has found a solid rock to stand on, a refuge to hide in, a foundation to build on, a life-saving vaccine to protect him from fear, anxiety, and depression, and death. And that vaccine is God's love for him. But it doesn't stop even there. David moves from a confidence in God's love to a confidence in God's deliverance. He goes on, I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Now trusting in God's love for him, David is able to confidently rejoice in God's deliverance or salvation. Notice the words, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. That tells us something. It hasn't happened yet. God hasn't delivered him yet. But he says, I'm just overwhelmed with joy that God's going to deliver me. I have confidence that he's going to save me. He's going to deliver me from whatever life brings to me. I am going to rejoice now at the deliverance I know is coming. David is so confident that God will act on his behalf because he loves him that he chooses to rejoice on it ahead of time. He refuses to let the circumstances of his life dictate his attitude toward God or life. You know, sometimes we always say, well, God, if you just show up, if you just, if you just deliver me from this, then I could get my joy back. <laughs> and David teaches us something here. He's like, no, get your joy back because God is going to deliver you. Whatever that means. Maybe he's going to take the circumstances away or change them, or maybe he's going to take you through the circumstances and deepen you along the way. But either way, God will deliver you. 
He won't let either, David wouldn't let either the circumstances, the difficulties, or the problems, or the enemies of his soul steal away his joy. His joy is entirely separated from his circumstances in life. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) He has found his joy in something more certain and unchanging because it is found in his trust in God and God's love for him. So here we go. (laughs) Someone reminded me I'm going to go from preaching to meddling. Will we trust God to deliver us from our circumstances or through our circumstances that he has allowed into our life? Is God sovereign or not? If he's sovereign, if he's in control, he's in control of everything. If he's not, he's not God. So if it's in your life, God, as as Oswald says, he engineered it to be allowed into your life. Um, And he did it for a good reason. Um, We just have to find him in the midst of it. Um, Are we going to live under the circumstances and problems or over the difficulties and problems as overcomers in Christ? What is our joy based on? Our circumstances or a confident trust in God's love and God's deliverance. Hey, I'm there with the rest of you. (laughs) You know, one of the wonderful things about being a preacher is you get to practice this. And for some reason, God always usually does that ahead of time for me. And I've had a difficult week, a difficult month, to be honest with you. And I've been discouraged, and uh, I've been borderline depressed, and I've been struggling. Uh, I'm overwhelmed with the circumstances of, of life and too much to do and the eternal woodpile in my front yard and you name it. <laughs> and, and the mice that keep killing themselves all night. <laughs> you know, and some things way more difficult than those. And I needed this today, so I thought I'd preach it to you. <laughs> but I'm there too, and I get down, and sometimes I lose my joy. <laughs> And I have to get reminded, and that's why God gave me a wife, (laughs) to pray for me and to say, Joel, (laughs) you need to make some changes. And most of those changes need to be in my heart and my thinking. So I'm not preaching this out. I'm a fellow traveler on this road. But, you know, David doesn't even stop there with finding his joy in God, even though he hasn't delivered him yet. He moves from a confident trust in God's love and a joy in God's future deliverance to finally a resolve to praise God for his goodness. He says, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is like the pinnacle of David's praise. This is the waters completely still. He resolves in his heart, again, a firm choice to sing to the Lord. You know, one of the wisest pieces of advice ever given to Christy and I as a ministry couple was at a pastor's conference, and the, and the, the speaker said, never let them take away your song. <laughs> that is very important. <laughs> we cannot lose our song. But you know, that's a decision. It's a decision we must make over and over again amidst the pressures and problems of life. You see, a singing heart according to Ephesians chapter 5, is the mark of a spirit-filled life. And uh, it's also the mark of a free heart and a calm, contented, and joyful soul. Oh. Why does David sing? He tells us, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. He has dealt abundantly with me. He has been, as some of the other versions said, good to me. The idea here may be even that David is so sure of God's deliverance that when it comes, he's already resolved to sing a song of praise for God's abundant, overflowing goodness and blessing on him. David has moved from being a sourpuss to singing praises, (laughs) from being self-focused to God-exalting, from desperate cries of help to delightful songs of joy. Have the circumstances changed yet? No. (laughs) Has the deliverance arrived yet? No. What has changed? Yeah, yeah, you're right. The change that's taken place is in David's heart, 
He brought his honest complaints. That's good. He brought his cries for help. God wants us to do that. And then he made a choice to trust in God, to trust in his love, and to trust that he's good. I'm sharing this with our life group this week that, um, you know, we're looking at 1 Peter, and, and one of the things Peter says in, 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 talking, in, in talking about our salvation, he says, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And he uses that phrase as the equivalent of being saved. To be saved, you have to know that God is good. You see, that's foundational. To believe that God is good and that God loves us is the bedrock foundation of our faith. It's in God and his love and his goodness. And I might add his sovereignty. (laughs) You know, when we have that foundation in life, what we can build on that is a life of praise and thankfulness and gratitude to him. A life where we experience the blessings of God and we say, wow, God has been, he has been so good to me. (laughs) You know, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about David's complaints and I was thinking about the complaints that we never give to God. (laughs) God, you have been so good to me. I wish you'd stop it. (laughs) You know, can you just be good to somebody else for a change? Because I can't take any more of your goodness to me. (laughs) God, you love me and you keep loving me and you overflowingly love me. And you abundantly love me. And you eternally love me. God, I can't take any more of your love. So would you please start loving somebody else? Because I know your love is limited. You know, you're only God. (laughs) We never complain about that to God, do we? (laughs) No, we'll take all the love. (laughs) We'll take all the goodness. We'll take all the blessing that that God will give us. And God's full of it. And God has a never-ending supply of it, not only for me, but for you and for everybody else who's ever lived and will live. God is good. All the time, yeah. And all the time, God is good. And God loves us. And God loves you. Put your name in there. God loves you. That's bedrock. And when we go there, We can sing a song of praise to God despite what's going on around us. You know, we may be heading into some dark days, some difficult days as a nation, as a people, and particularly, I think, as believers in Christ. What are we going to do in the midst of that? Where are we going to turn? I hope that we can take the lesson from David. You know, we can make those honest to God, you know, complaints to him, you know. And then we can make prayers and pleas and cries for help and deliverance. But let's also find in him through that, through those prayers, through that communion with him in prayer. Let's find a peon of praise in the goodness and love of God. How is your heart today? How is my heart today? Maybe you too need to move from desperation to, let, to delight. So let's trust him together. Let's trust that he's good. And let's trust that he loves you. And then let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you that your love was forever proved to us through Jesus Christ, your son. Enlighten our eyes today. (laughs) Shine on us today. Enable us to be honest with you and take our, our prayers for help to you. Knowing that you really do answer prayer. (laughs) And trusting in your goodness and your love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For who you are and all that you have done for us. Truly, we can say the Lord has dealt bountifully with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Uh, please stand and we'll close with uh, 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. <laughs>
Amen. Have a great week and uh, bless the Lord throughout the week.